1989, and this is one of the few examples of these paintings, I decided to begin to use artist paint, traditional artist pigments, along with fluorescent pigments. Yeah. And so that orange in the middle is pure cadmium orange. And okay. it, in a way, it's an experiment derived from uh, Adler's and the interaction of color. Because if you could cover the dayglow orange and make a, make a telescope with your hand, the, the cadmium orange would be very bright. You'd see it as pure orange. But next to the uh, dayglow orange, it looks like an earth color. Yeah. Uh, also, I would like to explain that you explain to, to the people that uh, are not flat paintings that have, have some texture. So tell, tell the people about that and how you, 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 you get, you produce the, the textures on the paintings. Because it looks like they have sand in some way. Well, the first thing I want to say is uh, <laughs> I, I think Robert will vividly remember this. We, we both studied an era in an era in which everyone said painting was dead and um, was an outmoded form of expression and we, the future would belong to photomechanical works, performance, etc. Well, as we all know, that didn't happen. So I gave a lot of thought to why that didn't happen. And if you go to a show of photographs or digital prints or anything else, each work will have the same texture. But if you go to a group show of paintings, each, presumably each painting by each painter will have a different kind of physical quality, different tactile quality. And it occurred to me that the reason painting is still around is that it combines both a tactile response and a response to an image, both sight and touch, if you will. And uh, when you think about it, all the paintings that we consider um, uh, great paintings like Vincent van Gogh, uh, what you think of first is really the texture and not the image of the wheat field. And texture doesn't have to be mean a brush stroke. In my case, the center square is covered with this uh, material called Rolotex that they use to cover walls in a motel or a restaurant. And that was to uh, give the geometry a kind of physical architectural quality. Because that in some way relates to the walls that you, you like to, 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 to show in, in part of your walls too. Yes, for me, the, uh, the square is not simply a square. It is meant to be perceived as an enclosed space, a space that you could enter. Uh, well, you can look at, someone could enter, but there's uh, no access to it, it's hermetic. Uh, but I, I felt by giving it a physical texture, I could make it read more. Let me just add that it's also two canvases that are bolted together. Yes. And um, people don't talk about this very much, but um, I really very seldom uh, veer away from the, the idea of um, uh, the painting as a flat modernist space. There's, there's figure ground, but there's very little other illusion. And uh, the two canvases represent the cell or square is above ground. The canvas separates the area that is below the ground. So in architectural terms, each of my paintings is, a, is seen as a sec section or side view. It's something that we want to talk now. So, uh, talking now, starting to talk about your philosophy that started in the 80s, um, that in some way was called by the art critics, uh, or even for the artists, you're going to clarify more about that, the neo-geo, or the neo-conceptualism. So, it came as a critic or as an opposition to the old school uh, more based in Mondrian, uh, more uh, uh, philosophical or spiritual kind of uh, geometry you, uh, that were used, uh, the geometry to organize the cities and, uh, and you came with the idea to criticize all of that 
and talk more about isolation, prisons, conducts, uh, a lot of uh, more psychological uh, terms associated with the society itself, like a new era. So um, for people that want to uh, understand that and the influence you, you got from Foucault or Baudrillard, uh, can you tell, uh, maybe you get from them the icons, the meaning of the icons that you are using, but I would like to talk about that. Uh, Aldo? Yeah. Yeah, can I make just uh, one yeah, introduction? Yeah, of course. I, I was uh, very happy to hear the word tactile in relation to painting, because I think this has been an ongoing issue. It just, it didn't end in the 70s, it's still going on. And then there is the virtual, which is the other kind of work that I think Peter was referring to. And uh, somehow, I think that these two are really kind of at war with one another. And uh, I think that, uh, we have to understand that they do not need to be at war with one another. I think they need to find some kind of commonality, some kind of uh, balance for a better word, in which the tactile and the virtual can coexist within art, even within painting from my point of view. Because uh, Robert, I would say the foremost proponent of that point of view happens to be from Argentina. And when you said that, I, I would immediately think of Fabian Marcaccio. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, uh, Peter, I, I, I'm showing the grade that is one of your first work that in some way start to explain uh, all of what I, I asked you before to explain about the, the meaning of isolation, the conducts, the prison, all the elements that are present in your, in your paintings as a way of express your ideas. So let's start with that so we can understand and people can understand what is the meaning behind the scene of your paintings, please. Well, uh, this painting was made when I first arrived back in New York. I grew up in New York and then went to university and then uh, spent six years in New Orleans, which is another story. Uh, but I arrived back in New York in 1980, shortly uh, after my paternal grandmother died. And in truth, um, uh, my first reaction to New York was a very existential one. I was interested in Gustin. I was really um, overwhelmed by the kind of isolation you can feel in a big city as a newcomer. And uh, uh, also deeply affected by my grandmother's passing. And so this painting, which is still painted with a brush, uh, with traditional artist paints, was in fact a, um, another kind of interpretation of geometry as a funerary monument. But I I'm glad you showed it because um, uh, as simple as my paintings are, I do think they're infused with, uh, from my point of view, they're infused with my own psychology and subjective reactions to the world. And this is, this is where that comes from. Uh, I choose this one because uh, in fact, even it's uh, maybe the first one or one of the first one, you can see even that there is not on purpose, uh, seems to have uh, two, two panels also. But uh, going back oh, to- Oh, just like, one. Yeah, but it seems to have two panels. The gray looks like one panel and the rest another panel. But at the same time, it's like yes. the door the door to the grave or can be uh, the, the, the land and the under, underground. So there are many meanings behind the painting. And that's what I found all the time in your painting. So but go back and please try to explain more about the, the ideas of uh, what about the society we saw before the 80s about uh, using the geometry just as uh, order, uh, um, kind of order for the, the cities? And then you came talking more about maybe the big brother, uh, about the prisons, about the isolation. So we can go over to another painting and start to, to show different aspects that are present in your work constantly since the 80s to the present, like the use of the prisons, the use of the condos, the use of uh, uh, isolation, 
connections, underground, all of that. What is the meaning behind that? Well, uh, the first thing I want to say in retrospect is I, I now realize I was a part of a worldwide phenomenon across many creative fields, which we call postmodernism, which was a critical response to modernism and modernist utopian ideas. Uh, at this, you see um, in an architect like Rem Koolhaas, his, his earlier work is almost an obsession with, uh, with uh, a postmodernist response to Le Corbusier. Uh, I always thought of uh, bands like the Talking Heads as having a kind of uh, postmodern relationship or Brian Eno with rock music. So uh, th there was, uh, uh, among all kinds of artists, this, this uh, uh, desire to challenge the assumptions of modernism. Now, in my case, I had grown up with geometric painting, and that, that was intuitively the, the way I've, I've, I've always been uh, oriented towards painting that way. I grew up with ideas two basic ideas, either as geometry as pure form, uh, which has no signified, which allows a kind of uh, pure experimentation with space and composition, or secondly, the idea of geometry as a kind of um, space of spirituality or connected to spirituality. But when I arrived back in New York, I became obsessed with the grid of the city, with elevators, with subways, with the fact that almost all our movements are regulated by human-made technological structures, streets, subways, and also telephones. Before This was before the computer, uh, the internet, of course. Uh, and uh, that first I started painting prisons as a, as a uh, response to this isolation. And that got me interested in Michel Foucault, who describes our movements in society and um, our existence in a, in a social landscape as determined by forces beyond our control. And then the work of uh, Jean Baudrillard, who began to uh, apply the same kinds of ideas to a digital era. Um, I want to mention, and certainly Robert will agree with this, I really have no feeling for um, pure philosophy. Both these writers, in my view, are more sociologists than philosophers. And essentially, I began to read uh, Foucault and Baudrillard and others because they were, in a way, their work is about the study of space, what happens in the space of our society. Um, and um, uh, as I was branching, heading into this new exploration, I, I found their ideas um, affirming the to be affirmative of the things I was trying to play with. Robert, something that you want to say about this? Uh... Well, uh, I remember being on a couple panels with uh, Baudrillard Art, and uh, uh, I liked him very much as a person, I can say that. And I, I liked a lot of his ideas, but it, as I recall, I mean, we're going back uh, at least uh, 25 years, whatever, but um, as I recall, uh, he wasn't terribly well received in the United States. Uh, I mean, there are those who were interested in him, but uh, those who saw him as uh, uh, not, uh, well, certainly not on the same level as uh, Michel Foucault, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, I always found his work uh, very open and very lively. And uh, I think that uh, he was, at the right place at the right time, frankly, uh, even though uh, he had a very uh, mixed uh, reception. You, you know, I would, I would agree. And um, uh, I don't have as high, opin as, uh, high an opinion of uh, Baudrillard that, that you do, Robert. 
But I, I think he had a key moment. And his, for me, his two key ideas were one, that Foucault's society of coercion has been replaced by a society of seduction. So all the things that earlier on we had to do because we were forced to by laws, by the police, uh, by restrictive structures, were all of a sudden replaced by things we are seduced into doing, such as being on Facebook, or, uh, uh, or, uh, 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 or going to shopping malls. They're, they're just as um, disempowering, but uh, we just rush in to do it rather than there's nobody cracking a whip. And to me, his second key idea developed in the late 70s or around 19, yeah, I guess the late 70s, was the idea of a system of linguistics that involved no outside referent. For Baudrillard, language and referentiality was entirely circular. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, this is when Richard Prince is starting and Cindy Sherman, both of whom I respect a great deal, who, and, and uh, a big impulse among certain artists of my generation was, we could no longer use nature as the absolute referent. That first of all, nature was, was no long, you could really not talk about it, a nature inseparable from culture. And secondly, that uh, in our daily lives, there, there really is no access to that absolute referent and everything becomes referential to something else within the cultural sphere. Okay, uh, Peter, uh, since the, the time is running a little fast, we will go through uh, different paintings until we start the installation. So uh, we saw already some of the icons you use. We're gonna keep going and you stop me. Uh, well, well, let's just start right here, stop right here for one second and then we can go through the others very quickly. Uh, there, there are three forms, three icons in my work. The cell, which is a square rectangle. The mm -hmm. prison, which is a square rectangle with bars on it. Yeah. And the conduit, which mm -hmm. is a kind of diagrammatic representation yeah. of how the cells or conduits are connected. Yes, in this case, the conduits are the red color uh, lines that you can we can see in the painting. That is something that you repeat in many of the paintings. So we saw the, the one before, we saw the prison. Uh, if we go back one second to the, yeah, mm -hmm. here, here we, we see the, the prison and, as well as the conduit. So we're gonna keep going on until we start with installation so we can discuss a little bit about uh, uh, this is I choose this one because talking about the the new era, the new the new conceptual and um, how the geometry was used supposedly in the past to organize the cities and now the new concept. I say, okay, ideal city. What is an ideal city for you, Peter? And what is it? This is painting. <laughs> well, this this painting is a satire of a kind of. Um, uh, uh, totally rationally organized ideal city, which is also perhaps a satire of a minimalist painting. It's one of the only two paintings I ever made, which are, are views in plan, in plan rather than in section. Okay. And as you can see, there's only one way in and out. Okay. Yes, it's just one exit. Yes. <laughs> it's scary. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, here we see you have something here that is not usually I see that is the smoke steak that is funny is the small uh, rectangle we can see in the painting that is a classic of the houses, mostly in the old houses, sometimes in, in England or even in France. Um, why why the, you, you place that in, the, in some of the series of the painting because here we can see the conduct. We see the, the the square in the middle, and here you add another 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 object, another icon. No, 
Well, um, in a way, my a lot of my ideas are are whimsical, and um, in all the paintings before this, the con the conduit had been underground, hidden. And uh, it, when I painted this painting, I, I thought of the idea of something and en entering the cell from the conduit and then uh, leaving through a smokestack, um, like uh, uh, a, uh, a gas entering the cell and then being expelled. But mm -hmm. what turned out to happen was after that, the conduits also began to um, inhabit the upper portion of the yes. painting, as you'll see in the next painting. Yeah, we will see in the next one. Also, uh, since there is a lot of meaning in my point of view as a collector, uh, please go back. Uh, I can I can uh, say maybe that in the smokestack in the painting before, Jorgelina, one sec, please. Uh, maybe you are expelling the toxicity of the society through the through that uh, icon, uh, all the toxic things go out from the smokestack. In the house, you you burn something, and you you is the way you escape. So maybe you are talking about the underground, and talking maybe about the dead people, and about the smell or whatever, and going to trying to find a way to escape. Uh, uh, I'm very comfortable with that. I, I'm complimented, Aldo, because you do know so much about my work. Okay, let's keep going, uh, please. So here is quite the same. Alpha Bill, this was uh, very funny to find this one. Alpha Bill, the name. There was some inspiration, something, uh, Peter, about that you place Alpha Bill. Sounds like a TV show. <laughs> well, it's the name of a film by Godard. Uh, yeah. about Paris, in fact, uh, in which he made a science fiction film. The setting was present day Paris in the 60s, but he he interpreted it as the future. These paintings were all named after films. There are no cells or prisons. And these are three flat panels. And uh, in these two years, I got interested in the idea of sequential spaces. So they were a little bit of a, a side road in my work. OK. Next, please. OK, here we start now with the, some of the exhibition I choose to, to see. And uh, this one is really one of the maybe the first ones is 1985. What well, is it international with monument? I, I didn't know what was the space in New York. Well, this is my one for first one person exhibition in, and included paintings from uh, 82 to 85. Uh, before this, uh, most of the people I met pretty much ignored my work. And um, people either said it was old fashioned because nobody's interested in minimalism anymore it was the uh, era of neo-expressionism. Uh, but this young gallery run by artists uh, got the idea. Uh, first of all, they were interested in the pictures generation and they began to show Cher Levine and Richard Prince mm. and um, uh, Laurie Simmons and Sarah Charlesworth and others, none of whom had galleries at the time. So they were willing to have shows with this uh, art gallery run by a bunch of artists in their 20s. And then Meyer Weissman, who was in charge of the gallery, was also looking for what would what was interesting after the pictures generation. And um, uh, uh, he began to show my work. And right after me, um, this was in April. And the next show was Jeff Koons in May. So the, part, the very interesting and clever thing that Meyer did was to introduce this work in the context of uh, the pictures generation. I want to add to that, that uh, for the people that we, we are watching that uh, uh, your work in some way, the neoconceptualism was also related with Jeff Koons and people like Steve, Bar Steve Parino also uh, yeah. at that time. So we can keep going, uh, please. 
I think I, we have more pictures of this uh, one. Yeah, uh, this is another one in 1989. Uh, big paintings. Let us know a little bit about this exhibition in Sonaban. Well, as you can see, the conduits are uh, no longer simply underground. They're springing up in every conceivable direction. And uh, this is a point at which um, I began to, I was uh, in the eighties, I was using uh, fluorescent paint as a kind of ideological statement, uh, a sort of claim for artificiality. But by this time, I also began to use artist paint and mixing colors and uh, the vocabulary of the paintings opened up. But at the same time, I was also um, uh, getting tired of making very didactic, minimalist, um, uh, rational paintings. And the paintings that begin now and go into the 90s uh, are, are much more frenetic and out of control. And the conduits and cells have all kinds of strange relationships. Yeah, because you start to make it, uh, we will see that you start to make it more complex. The conducts start to connect everywhere. The prisons are up, down. Uh, uh, so, okay, let's keep going so we can uh, watch the next ones and start to see different. Uh, this is really minimal. It's in the same exhibition. So oh, no, uh, this one is actually, uh, it should be 87. Ah, okay. And then the, and the reference. Oh. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the previous one was 91. Yeah. This, this, is, this is the end of the minimalist ones. I love these ones, We're really plain ones. Yes. Uh, well, you know, a lot of people prefer the work of the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. OK, let's keep moving to the next exhibition. And that is 87, uh, by the way. Okay. What? What? Took my attention, pay my attention. This exhibition made in 1995 in, in one of the biggest gallery in, in France, Tadeusz Ropak, is uh, uh, I'd like to know more about what you, the drawing in the middle of the, the, the two paintings. You have a prince on the on the right side and a painting on the left side, and in the middle is a, is like a configuration of some description of the conducts on the prisons or whatever. So tell us a little bit about this exhibition and what is the meaning of the, the, the drawing you made in the middle? Okay. Um, well, uh, it's a flowchart. And uh, this particular one um, essentially describes a, how the computer processes information, if I remember correctly. And all of a sudden, I became aware that uh, the digital world and the world of organizational charts and the world of academia was increasingly um, dominated by this kind of flow chart space, which is more or less exactly the space of my paintings. On the right is a, a silk screen print of a cell exploding and ending up as a pile of rubble. And uh, by this time, I was interested in doing installations as a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, uh, combining paintings, uh, flowcharts on the wall, in this case, um, also a oversized um, silk, silk screen prints. Oh. There, there are two more photos if you want to continue. Yes, we will go back then to talk about the explosion later. So uh, this is also the same exhibition. We, we can see a chart also in the middle. Uh, uh, but by this time, I'd also like to mention in 93, I started drawing on the computer. So the forms are no longer squares, uh, but these two paintings have in a way exactly the same configuration, but the computer allowed me to stretch things or, or squish things and change the space in a very uh, 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 rubbery, uh, flexible way. So for the next uh, decade or so, I, uh, uh, a lot of my compositional process was involved with this process of condensing or stretching. Okay. Let's go. Uh, this is the same gallery. The space mm -hmm. is um, And now we go to the Dallas Museum. 
another float chart, which is hard to see. You see the print again and fiberglass reliefs I made in um, the early 90s. And um, well, I, I have a little story here. This exhibition, uh, I began showing with Kagosian Gallery in uh, 93. And this was the show I had planned for Gagosian Gallery. But uh, they said, we don't want you to do an installation. You're supposed to be a painter. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I left the gallery and uh, fortunately uh, uh, the Dallas Museum of Art gave me this one room and one room exhibition in which I was able to execute the installation. Peter was the Gagosian in New York, no? Yes. Okay, let's keep going please, Jorgelina. Thank you. This is the same exhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. We stop here one sec. We have, I think, more than one. Yeah. Okay. Here you mix again the the intervention of the space with the prints and uh, mix it with. Well, well, these are my first digital prints behind those two paintings. If we can yeah. go back one, and when digital printing came along, I was fascinated because okay, traditional yeah. printmaking. Traditional yeah. printmaking means you have to do. 50 or 20 or 100 of the same, exactly the same image. But uh, with digital prints, you can change it each time. So in this case, it's the same composition, uh, but uh, 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 it's a set of 20 or 30 different um, uh, uh, color compositions. And I was interested in the idea of one, sp one space juxtaposed with another one. Okay. And uh, by this point, I was also using metallic paint. Those, those, the ochre and uh, gray on the left are actually yes. uh, bronze and silver. And if I can sort of uh, pay myself a compliment, by the late 90s, the, the uh, conduits are going everywhere. And I really do think I was being affected by the space of the World Wide Web where connections just proliferate in every direction. The early, the early paintings only had a kind of linear communication. And also the texture uh, in, the, in the paintings we saw in the 80s, like the one in the collection, the texture maybe is, is just in one part of the painting. Uh, here, when you use the color like the, the gray one that is, uh, looks like uh, um, metallic uh, painting, but uh, that like a car painting, the textures come up also in m more areas. Uh, the, 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 the metallic painting has textures also. So you st start to span the texture in your paintings too. It's not just focusing an area of the painting, if not, it's almost everywhere. Well, every, every rectangle, every cell and every prison is, is Rolotex, has yeah. this stucco texture. Okay, let's keep going, please. Thank you, Jorgelina. Let's move Same to the, exhibition. Yeah, the next, the next exhibition. So this one, I cannot see the name of the exhibition on the, on the bottom. Oh, this is a Museum of Modern Art. Yes. And uh, I'll stop here because here is a, it's an exhibition just about prints. So yes. Um, this exhibition about print is made on the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And um, please explain, you told me uh, all of these prints are based on explosions. And I said, wow, explosion, I'm scared. So what's going well, on? You know, explosions are you talking about? Well, another obsession I've had since the early 80s that you see in the print on the left is the idea of the cell not as stable, but as exploding, as ceasing to exist. And for some reason, um, the explosion image began to predominate my graphic work, my work with digital prints. And it's sort of a kind of um, classical romantic opposition, stability versus change. Uh, and uh, in, some years ago, a, um, a book came out by the uh, German uh, 
philosopher Sloterdijk, I think I pronounced it correctly, called Terror from the Air. And he defines the explosion as the uh, characteristic icon of the 20th century, whether it's terrorism or nuclear bombs uh, or other kinds of explosions. And um, it's in complete contrast to the kind of stable system of my work, but uh, you'll see it come up again and again in the images we'll look at next. Okay. Let's, let's move. Yeah. This is the one of uh, public installation uh, permanent in the Dallas Fort uh, Airport. Tell us a yes. little bit. Uh, I don't know the size in uh, in uh, meters, but it's uh, 40 feet long, yeah. and clearly one of the biggest paintings made uh, in recent years. And I I'm very proud of it. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Okay, I like this one a lot uh, because it represents a lot of uh, your idea about society, about uh, uh, some of uh, your principles that are we can see in all of your works. Tell us about the prison. Well, um, I haven't mentioned uh, Andy Warhol yet, who has, a, has always been a huge influence on me. Yeah. So this is a small place, a space in Portland, Oregon, called Disjecta. And they asked me to do an exhibition in this enormous space, but they had no money. And so they couldn't transport paintings or anything like that. And so uh, I decided to do a exhibition only using digital prints. And it's been exciting to work with digital prints because every year it, they become less and less expensive and uh, better quality. And so what I did was I took uh, studies for my paintings and combined them in these various kinds of, um, uh, of uh, juxtaposed grids. And uh, that became the environment in which people enter, when it, what you were in this environment when you entered. And I mentioned Warhol because he, he would all, always find a way to do things DIY, do it yourself. Uh, he preferred cheap to expensive. He preferred uh, spontaneous to planned. And he also recycled his imagery over and over again. And uh, uh, that's what I'm doing here. Great. Okay. Um, let's go to. Yeah, this is yeah. another thing about prisons too. Again. Well, let's look at the next one. That's that's the entrance to the exhibition. Yeah. No. Oh, uh, one more, please. Yeah. Uh, throughout the '90s and 2000s, the aughts. Uh, uh, I did a series of small paintings like this, which were simple prisons. I sometimes compare them to Joseph Albers um, homage to the square. Uh, they always had uh, the same limited number of elements. And uh, for me, they were like writing a haiku or uh, um, creating leader songs, very simple, but allowed me to uh, focus on color relationships. The ones on the left are all the same size and same composition. The ones on the back wall are all uh, metallic and pearlescent paint. Yeah, in some way, um, sometimes I found these, uh, these paintings, Peter, some relation with the Imig novel also. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, for the for the kind of shade used on the painting and also for the colors uh, because Imi also loves to use the the pink fluish and, uh, yeah, and true. Uh, so he he works also in installation he likes the kind of uh, sculptural paintings uh, more than the simple ones okay let's keep uh, keep following 
is the same exhibition. And yes. Then, yeah, let's go to the other one. One more view. Yeah, it's a beautiful exhibition, this one. Thank you. Okay. Let's stop here. This is a heartbreaking painting. <laughs> no, it's, thank you. One is it? This one is from the 80s for sure. So yes, um, it belongs to the Guggenheim Museum. Yeah, yeah. I remember is, when I, when I was starting to to look uh, for one of your paintings, there was one like this with a uh, black with uh, with some orange, like similar size. Uh, I think that was uh, belonged to Mary Boone Gallery and uh, was referred to me by Joe Houston at that time. And unfortunately, we came later, but uh, I'm happy that the one we, we get. So let's see other uh, other images of this exhibition that it, is just about big paintings, this one. What was the idea? It's a very small museum near Yale. They were interested in working with artists who had a connection to Yale. Uh, and um, the curator, whose name is Ben Coleman, was simply brilliant. It's only nine paintings, but uh, it spans my whole career. And he decided to concentrate on big paintings, some of which were in museums. And it, it was a wonderful uh, example of how you can have a small show with nine paintings and uh, uh, really tell a lot about the artist. So this is one from the 80s. Let's see the other paintings of the same space. Uh, this is one from about uh, mid 90s. Yeah. Back to the 80s. I love this one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's a San Francisco Museum of Art. It's one of my. It's from the 80s. Uh, yes, it's one of my uh, more pessimistic works. Yeah. Some Ad Reinhardt there also, no? Yeah. Okay, let's keep going to the other one. Oh my and God. You're looking from at the 80s painting and the background one from the late 90s. Yeah. Okay, this is the one that belongs to the collection, Isolation. It's 1989 also, 2 meters 20 something by 2 meters 20 something. The, the picture uh, was made in the Magba in uh, October 2015. Let's go to the next exhibition, please. Ah, I love this one. This was uh, uh, an intervention. I like this one also because it's really something different. You you make an intervention on the space, or, or working uh, with the idea of intervening even the light of the space because everything turned out the light to different colors. We will see pictures in in yellow and pictures in blue. So I don't know how many colors you use it, but well, it's the I'll first explain. Thing. Yeah. Uh, at, at, at the Schoen Kunsthalle, they commission artists to make work in this entrance rotunda, which is at the entrance of the museum, which has this big skylight that you see at the top. Yeah. And they invited me to exhibit in the summer. So yeah. I had to work with the idea that the biggest component of the installation would be the sun. And so I, the, the skylight is covered with yellow film. The uh, images on the windows are metallic, uh, are, are digital yellow prints on a metallic surface and the floor is painted yellow. So when you enter the space, it was like entering a yellow swimming pool, a yellow world. Uh, you can see the difference in the light outside of the space through the doorway and inside the space. Uh, when I do installations, my work is really site specific and um, almost like an architect, I really do enjoy the challenge of thinking of something to respond, respond to the specific situation. I would like to see the, the next uh, picture where we can see the, the roof, the ceiling. Yeah, it's an anchor yellow. Yeah, it's a wide angle picture, but a very effective image. Oh my God, yeah. 
And we will see in another, in another uh, photos, the color became uh, blue also, uh, that one, wow. Oh, well, no, let me explain. Behind uh, those windows are two inside galleries, both of which are circular spaces. So the next images that we'll see are behind those windows inside. Okay. So on, on one floor, uh, if we look at the next image, uh, that that is one of the circular galleries. And what I what I did was um, reproduce my sketches from the 1980s uh, and combine them with some uh, uh, diagrams from uh, uh, from physics into a kind of uh, coded narrative. So that, that was one circular gallery. And then if you go on to the next one. The, How many the, colors you use, Peter? Because here we can see blue also. Well, that is the other floor. Uh, mm -hmm. The yellow is the first floor, the blue is the second floor. Okay. And that, that is prints uh, illuminated by uh, black light, ultraviolet light. So it, it was almost very science fictional. You know, black light makes white look blue and creates this, you know, um, uh, a very theatrical luminosity. Okay, the next one. Well, this was a year ago in Venice. Um, this is a gallery of the art school in a 500 year old warehouse mm -hmm. and you couldn't touch the walls. So uh, you had to build a structure within the warehouse and uh, the space is about 150 feet long. So it was a series of rooms that you, um, uh, you passed through with, uh, each of which had a different kind of narrative. And um, no paintings again, uh, only digital prints. I collaborated with other artists, yes. but it was, uh, the idea was really to construct a narrative space with a strong reference to history and to Venice. Uh, if you look at the next image, uh, you'll see the first room, which I thought of as uh, an Egyptian tomb. Mm -hmm. And the writing belongs to another artist. I don't recall the uh, name. Well, uh, well uh, no, it belongs to a, a, uh, uh, a, a writer from, uh, from Paris named Elena Sorokino. Uh, yes. her, she, her background is Russian. And mm -hmm. she wrote these cryptic texts to go to go with uh, to cover this box. Why you choose it again? The, the yellow is uh, I see the, the yellow really often is a, is a really strong relation with the the sun, with the light, uh, with the, some of the favorite colors of Albert. So what, what is the why why yellow? Well, it's also it's both luminous and slightly. Um, uh, uh, sl slightly off-putting. It looks uh, a yellow light is is sort of uh, makes you an, one un uneasy. So it reflects both light and uh, but something that's not that comfortable. But I have noticed that in in Catholic iconography, the uh, behind the altar, the dove is always surrounded by yellow light. So um, it, it, it does have this sort of association with uh, uh, religious uh, use of the color as well. But also, Peter, uh, talking about, uh, suppose we are inside a prison there, uh, could be a detention center, a guy in a, in a chair and a light in the face making the, <laughs> uh, go and speak and tell me the truth and they use a lamp. So um, also it's a really interesting collaboration. I saw that you've been in, uh, doing this with the different artists. So let's keep going please to the next one so we can move to another one and we will try to close the, the talk. Yes, uh, we're almost done. Yeah. Uh, why, this... why, why the name Heterotopia? 
Oh, uh, well, uh, heterotopia is a term invented by Michel Foucault, and it refers to a space that has a special purpose, uh, either a pleasant purpose or unpleasant purpose, that has its very definite boundaries that you're either inside or outside and is usually inhabited by a specific group of people for a specific purpose. So for example, a ship is a heterotopia, a prison is a heterotopia, but a um, health club or, or uh, if you went to for hot baths or something like that, a, a, a sauna place would also be a heterotopia. Uh, so uh, he also associated it with traditional societies uh, the way, well, I mentioned the sauna, but uh, they would have hot baths for the men or hot baths for the women as uh, purifying rituals. Uh, and um, our society is full of heterotopias, and Venice is a heterotopia. <laughs> and it struck me that um, um, uh, to make a heterotopia within a heterotopia was sort of interesting. Okay, I, I think that there, there, there is another heterotopia and then we finish and we can make conclusion. Yes, it was made in New York and there is a funny picture of you painting the space, I think in this one. Yes, the next photo. you have that. Yes, I, I take it. Yeah, I actually use the stucco Rolotex wow. on the outside. I use it for, for the real purpose for a change. And my, this uh, gallery has very tall ceilings and I was able to make an uh, installation with um, basically two floors. And the idea was that uh, I made a enclosed space with uh, more or less one room for each painting. This is the outside of the installation and uh, the next, paint, the next uh, photo will show the inside. Oh, well, this one is sort of hard to uh, decipher, but um, there were also windows um, uh, connecting the spaces. Uh, please go on to the next one. This is a long space with one painting at the end. In, 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 some, in some way, this, this kind of uh, uh, playing with the light, the space, appropriating uh, the walls with the prints, in some way, if I just see the, the, the photo, can be one of your works. Uh, you are reproducing in, a, in real size, uh, appropriating the space. Well, I've always been interested in the relationship between painting and architecture. Yeah. So for me, the paintings reflect the plan of the architecture and the plan of the architecture reflects the composition of the paintings. So it had a kind of circular circularity that that was a lot of fun for me. Okay, I like the green in the, on this one. I know it's fluorescent green. Yeah, and the, the painting was very much intended as an altar of some kind. Yeah, there is a next one. Okay, we have finished. Okay. Uh, I know that there is some questions. Um, yes, yeah. if, you, yes. If, you, if you if you want, I can make. A, I have many questions for Peter and for Robert. Robert I can I can be making them if you want. Yeah, let's go. Okay, let's go for the first one. It's uh, Heterotopia Two in Manhattan. Uh, some of the participants say that you uh, explore the relationship between paintings and architectural space that uh, uh, that takes the public into a hyper real science fiction world. The specific question is, uh, it seems like you are adding the context to your work and creating a bigger work, which is your art plus the context. Can you explain us if, uh, what are you experienced or exploring with, 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 with these two exhibitions, number one and number two? Well, uh, the one in Venice had no paintings. I want to be clear about that. But um, Heterotopia Two in New York, um, uh, I've all, again, 
I've always been interested in paintings that have a specific location in architecture. And, you know, I love Baroque churches, Baroque palaces, the, 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 the painting and the architecture and the, uh, uh, always, are, are always, always work together. And depending on the architecture, you can make the paintings do different things. If you turn a corner and suddenly encounter a painting, it will feel differently than if you see it from far away. And honestly, my, my interest is in creating that kind of Gesamtkunstwerk between, between the space and the painting. Okay. Uh, something mentioned that you donated uh, some works uh, for the Coalition for the Homeless. And uh, they are asking, what is your experience of helping others in, so, in such hard times? Uh, well, um, I did a, in the early 90s, I did a digital print that uh, if you bought one, you were, you printed it at home and it didn't exist physically unless somebody printed it. And so uh, this was in the early 90s and I thought it was such a great idea and they were $25 each and uh, but the, I on, only three people bought one. So uh, I wanted to do something, uh, uh, it was actually the Food Bank of New York and Black Lives Matter, but uh, I wanted to contribute and also, you know, do something that people would find enjoyable. So every time somebody printed one and sent me back the photograph, uh, I would, uh, they wouldn't donate to these organizations, but I would and uh, each organization got $25 each. And uh, uh, so um, about 15 people made prints. So that was a donation of 15 times 50. I, I, I also uh, uh, support things in a more traditional way, but you know, part of um, encouraging people to support worthwhile causes is, you know, to create some interest around, around it. Like when there's a charity auction or an art auction to support an organization, it, you know, it just draws attention to. Peter, thank you so much to be in, uh, join us and to be here. Uh, thank, mm, thanks to Robert also. And I hope to see you soon. And thanks again to everyone.